Now, I, we're going to get to these Lula clips in a second. And I, there's a please watch this entire interview because this is actually somebody who both has a communicative ability and capacity to actually win as a center left candidate. And he also has a very good diagnosis of these things internationally. And there's one part, and maybe this won't be in what we clip, but like, I didn't want to play it because it, I mean, it's incredibly funny, but it gets into it. it like if an interview with the most prominent political prisoner in the world becomes like another point to have like a petty argument about 2016, that's not helpful. But Greenwald is pushing him a lot to diagnose the global rise of the far right. Like, why is this movement succeeding? And it is. It's the poll numbers are growing in Germany. It's relevant and growing in the UK. It's governing in many respects in the UK. It's governing in the United States, it's governing in Brazil, it's governing in India, it's governing in Hungary, it's governing in the Philippines, it's governing in Israel, it's governing in Russia. It's, you know, we know all this stuff but it's governing in Argentina. And and Lula, you know, when he when he pushes him on the United when Greenwald pushes Lula on the United States, Lula basically says he's like Glenn, Glenn. And he says in Portuguese, but the verbatim quote is like I know Hillary Clinton pretty well. The Democrats could have definitely found somebody who was more appealing. <laughs> it's like the direct quote. And he's just like look, he's like maybe if Obama was running for a third term, it would be different. Maybe if I was allowed to run, it would be different. And I think this is a really important point because as much as these fights are ideological, there's also just like people need to start treating being a politician as like something that you develop professional capacity in and you actually do effectively from a communications and campaigning standpoint because that's just an inescapable part of how you're going to win or not. And in India, Gandhi was literally inherited dynastic power with very little charisma and the opposite biography act arc of Narendra Modi. Narendra Modi's father was a tea seller. Came up literally from a profoundly disadvantaged position, which has been amplified and propagandized in the Indian electorate. So anyways, let's uh, place these Lula clips. He had an hour with uh, Greenwald. These interviews were requested before the 2018 election. They were refused by the Brazilian Supreme Court. He was silenced during an election that, again, he led by double digits in the polls and was sentenced without any material evidence. It always bears repeating. And uh, it's in Portuguese, so if you're watching, you'll see the English subtitles, but we'll slow it down, uh, slow it down a touch so I can uh, repeat it for people that are listening. The first uh, question has to do with his treatment in prison where he is being held in solitary confinement and Lula is going to speak on that, but also make a point about the poverty of Brazil. So let's start with clip number two with Glenn Greenwald and uh, Lula de Silva. Many people have been asking me how you've been treated in prison and you've said many times that the, thar the authorities here are humane and professional. Is this still the case? I don't know what humanitarian treatment means in prison means. I'm locked up and I'm in solitary confinement. And it really is solitary because... Most of the time, I'm completely alone. I meet with my lawyers, and that's it. And with my family once a week. I don't know whether to consider this decent. What allows me to endure this without loathing it, and with a brighter outlook, is knowing that there are millions and millions of Brazilians living in freedom who are in worse conditions than I am. At least I have an opportunity to have lunch and dinner. Well, Brazil, it is a country that you govern for eight years and a country with many people in prison. How would you compare your treatment in this prison? 
with the treatment they get in all the other prisons. Take the Brazilians who live in houses, stilt houses above swamps. They're living as second-class citizens. A citizen has to live in a single nine-square-foot room, has to have lunch, dinner, and has to cook, make love, go to the bathroom, and do everything in those nine square meters. That's not living any better than I am here. That's why I'm less concerned about my situation. Okay, so that's, again, that's just reorienting. And I think this is very important because that sort of earthy language and direct description of how millions of people are living is why this guy was able to rise uh, without any formal education coming from extreme poverty and get into leadership. But this is where, um, this is, I think, important. And there was a lot of conversation on both the Workers' Party record, but also the rise of the far right and how to answer it and Lula's perception of it. So here he is, he's talking about the right's rise across the globe. This issue, wait, is this slowed down? Oh, I don't, this is just, this is neoliberalism in the PT? Well, there's three and four on the list. So I have the difference, class politics in Brazil, difference between him and Bolsonaro, and then there's explaining the ultra right-wing rise in the globe and the left reaction. Is that it? That's number three? Okay. Yep. What's the relation between population suffering and their sudden embrace of far-right leaders? Like Bolsonaro and others throughout the democratic world. Neoliberalism as it arose during the era of globalization is losing ground everywhere. It is not just losing ground to the left, but also to the right. And as it lost to Hitler and to Mussolini. And at the same time, we've had two recent examples in Spain and Portugal of the left coming back during elections. And even in Germany, where Angela Merkel is a very strong politician, if she hadn't formed a coalition with the Social Democrats, she wouldn't be in power. But even there, the far right is growing. I know, it's growing the world over. And I think it's a warning call for the left. Yes. But the right wing won't. won't. You can be sure of the fact that Bolsonaro and Macri, Cristina Kirchner will win in the next elections. In Brazil, the left wing will win the next election. You can be certain that if Evo Morales runs for president, he'll win in Bolivia. At the same time, I hope that Americans will have the good sense to prevent another term of Trump as president. Because he's not just a problem for the U.S., he's a problem for the whole world. So, <laughs> Blaming in a, the electorate with a, Lula da Silva. <laughs> Well, actually, in the not exactly, um, not exactly at all. But there was another clip where he explains, and it's interesting in light. I wish we had pulled it. Maybe I'll pull it another time for TMBS, where he talks about the origins and Bolsa and uh, Thatcher and Reagan of this globalization model. And the first thing he says about it is, he literally in the Lula, he's like, he's like, free movement of capital, not people. <laughs> <laughs> as he sets the stage for how to understand how that works. Um, but then I think this is really important because what he's identifying, though, in the, in the sort of left that's regaining power and could still win is he's talking about people like Morales who really do have populist politics. And then he's also talking about people who are effective communicators and able to actually counteract this trend. And then in this clip, he's going to talk about specifically to Brazil because... What Glenn is doing is Glenn is talking about how PT fits into this sort of like broader pattern in Brazil. But Lula says like, look, we're here because of my successes, which is a really important point. And also how the Brazilian elite 
And I think this is where we can start looking at socially reactionary politics as being of the elite in many different cases, as a sort of even cultural reaction to other people just even coming up, even if their position isn't threatened. So let's play this final clip where he talks about class politics in Brazil and Bolsonaro. The rise of, there a under the rise of other, I can't read that because of the blur. The rise of Bolsonaro and other extremists and neoliberal ideologues in a, both the country and in a country, and how you run the country, how Dilma ran the country, yeah. And those ideologies, what difference do you see? When you started this interview, I said clearly that PT's biggest problems, that's the Workers' Party, come not from its errors, but from its successes. Every time that president tries to enact socially minded policies in Latin America, they're eventually ousted. The elite in Brazil and in other countries don't accept economic development policies that contain social inclusion. PT managed to enact, and this is according to the UN, not me, the greatest changes in social inclusion in the history of this country. It's important to remember that during our mandate, it was the only time in history that the poor had a higher rate of economic upturn than the rich. The rich made gains too, but the poor had an even greater percentage. It was the only time in history, and this bothered people. You should have heard it in the Rio de Janeiro airport, in the Sao Paulo airport, when people said the airport's starting to look like the bus station with all these poor people around, people who've never taken a plane in their life. And I actually think that when you look at the base of the Trump electorate, which is actually like people making a pretty good income um, in pretty ethnically homogenous white suburbs, that that other sense of it's not just, and this is where I think some of the distinction between economic fear and social reactionary politics in some ways collapses because you can both fear that you might lose actual material resources as well as status, which you can't just separate all the time. They're interdependent and interacting. And also that you resent, even if you're still feeling well, and this is, I think, where it is, the pure status thing, even just the visual of people coming up from the bottom and emerging. And Lula spoke exactly about that dynamic in Brazil because that is what happened. You had tens of millions of people taken out of poverty, living radically better lives. And there is a cultural contingent that Bolsonaro tapped into, which is why there's an ex even higher murder rates of police among uh, of innocent people. He's saying farmers should have the right to kill people without cause if they go on their land. That's all part of that same psychology. I'd recommend people watch the whole interview. There's a lot more. And obviously, we can't play all of it. I'll play more of it on TMBS later. And as always, you need to talk to your Democratic candidates and representatives about this. And there's been letters, one in 2018, one in the spring that have involved Brazil, uh, but only one in 2018 that specifically dealt with the Lula case and how barring his candidacy was undermining Brazilian democracy. There needs to be a lot more. I don't take anybody's progressive bona fides remotely seriously if they're not talking about Lula's imprisonment. It's, it's astonishing and disgusting. And it's also amazing because this is a very good strategic mind. Like this is somebody who has a lot of lessons for how this works and how these trends can be counteracted, which he gets into a lot more detail in uh, the full interview. You're calling from a seven...